Without a vision, the people perish. Welcome to Vision Plus, a program featuring a positive outlook, dealing with everyday situations of marriage, children, and business. Believing Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. Teacher, author, speaker, delighting audiences from New York to Sacramento with a hardened message for the people today. Bonnie would like to remind you of the 800 number on the screen. Please feel free to call at any time throughout the broadcast and share your concerns. Leave your prayer request and someone will pray with you. And now, teacher, author, and speaker, Bonnie. Hello and welcome. I'm Bonnie Libhart, and you're watching Vision Plus. And there's people in this room that had a vision for their own life, and one of them is running camera, took his lunch hour. He's the owner of EnviroSafe, and you may remember him as Dr. Nixon's husband, but he really has the name Terrell. And Dr. Nixon is here also. She's the one that told me about the person you're going to meet in just a moment. And one of wonderful things about her is that I call her a true American, pulled herself out of the uh, herself up out of the boots with her bootstraps or something like that a single mother never married and yet now she's the head of something that is so incredible that has come to northern alabama that together throughout the whole united states uh maybe fifty thousand students everywhere but uh we'll learn a little bit more about her in just a moment well when dr nixon and i were daryl's wife when we were in the philippines just recently we both were called visiting professors and that woman set me up so many places to speak which i really appreciate from dr nixon she is a promoter and an incredible teacher does online teaching and she also uh, speaks wonderful English better than I do most of the time and uh, we also fed a lot of people there were children that lived in huts with dirt floors three different times there were like over a hundred uh, children that came for the slippers and the food and also we uh, gave them uh, in addition to the wonderful food that mostly her mother was in charge of getting cooked was uh, we also gave them clothing and then we went to what's called um, Christ let's see Christ oh what in the world was the name of that poor Christo I believe maybe it's that but anyway it was people that are uh, were abandoned not just women but men and women they don't really have a health care system like we do in the United States and some of those elderly people just got abandoned so we went there and spoke to that group in a group in uh, the oh several groups were with us in fact gave them clothing there was one lady there she's I don't know what her age was but uh, older than what the Bible says you're supposed to be to to live but 80 ish and she had the most beautiful voice she was blind she came out and sang. We danced with all the people. It was just a wonderful experience that uh, we had over there. And uh, one of the reasons that I'm meeting and you're getting to meet this person today is because Dr. Nixon told me about Jamie Carpenter. Uh, Jamie, welcome. Thank you. It's nice to be here. Now, tell me a little bit about yourself, where you're from originally, your child. And I can't leave the name off. You know that. Okay, yes. Um, I'm originally from Springfield, Missouri, and I relocated to Madison, Alabama in uh, March of this past year in 2008, along with my seven-year-old daughter, Kennedy. What a great name. Now, Missouri is the show-me state, so uh, did they have to show, what did you do there that you were shown? Um, yes, in Missouri, we're known for we've got to see it to believe it, and I definitely would say that I have that personality, but um, actually, I, I um, 
from Missouri, I went to college at University of Arkansas and then returned back to Missouri and always knew that I had a calling to be in a helping profession. And so right out of college, I actually went to work for um, a career college as a recruiter and worked my way up um, at a couple of different colleges into a campus director position. And eventually that led me to ITT Technical Institute. And um, a, a great number of things that impressed me about ITT Tech and um, just their philosophies um, re resonating with all of the campuses and everything that we do about achieving student success and helping other people to be able to um, accomplish their vision and their career and be able to make a life change that can affect not only themselves but their families and hopefully then impact the business community um, as well by being able to provide a better qualified pool of candidates into the job market. And so there were a number of things that drew me to ITT Tech specifically, um, but th probably the most exciting was the opportunity to be able to come to Madison, Alabama and the Huntsville area and start a campus from the ground up and be able to um, build a future for students and impact the business community here in a positive way. Well, you can't be all bad if you went to the University of Arkansas and graduated. My brother played for the Razorbacks. He was, and so when they played in year two ago, they played Auburn and actually University of Arkansas, the Razorbacks beat Auburn at the time, and I was going to a church where the preacher was uh, had gone and played with Auburn, so I asked him, I said, can I come to church today since the Razorbacks beat <laughs> Auburn? So uh, yeah, we love that sc uh, that school. All, school. all schools are good. Some just have a little better uh, football team than others, yeah. and some they just, we won't even go into Bama and Utah, we'll just leave that subject. In Penn State, my husband went to Penn State, and Penn State got beat for the first time, I think, in years and years and years anyway. They had played almost the whole season without maybe lost one game, and then they lost in uh, the last one, oh, boo-hoo. Mm -hmm. But uh, whatever school we go to, there's some incredibly good things. Now, what I like about yours, which I want to get into more about helping the family and the community, but let's first go back to your uh, getting into college and when you had your child and how you were able to go forward with your life. Tell us a little bit about because what we want to show is that anyone, I got married at age 16, went on to school, had three children, went on to school, went on to school, finally got my doctorate, and I used to pick cotton. I don't want to do that anymore. And what we found in the Philippines is like 80 or 90 percent of the people have a college education, and that's because they don't want to be in poverty. They don't want to be, well, they don't pick cotton over there, but they don't want to be where they used to be. So tell us a little bit about, uh, you didn't just come in on uh a uh, golden chip with a gold spoon in your mouth. Tell us about your childhood and your years before Kennedy was born. Sure. Um, I actually was a first-generation college student. Um, neither of my parents had graduated with a college degree, and actually I have two siblings who also did not graduate with a college degree. So um, I am the only one in my immediate family who has done that. And um, for me, it, it wasn't really a decision that I think I ever made. It was just something that I always knew that I wanted to do. Um, and, you know, in today's world and in the job market, it really is something that is a necessity to be able to, um, you know, promote up and advance in a career and, and um, do some of those things. So that was always a, something that I knew that I would go on and do. Um, it certainly wasn't easy. I did work three jobs um, at different times, you know, while going to college. And I think that's one of the reasons that for me, it's easy to be able to relate a lot of times to our students who come from difficult situations and share with them that no matter what the situation is, I know that you can overcome that and, and be successful. Um, as I mentioned earlier, just out of college I started my career in higher education and it was approximately um, probably two years into my career when I found out that I was pregnant with my daughter. And I was in a position where I worked a great number of hours, um, you know, well over 40 hours a week. And so it certainly was a challenge to be faced with um, that situation and, and try and make the right decision about how to be able to move forward. But um, much like going to college, I always knew that, you know, I would find a way um, to be able to provide the best life 
possible for my daughter. And um, so I went through uh, somewhat of a difficult situation when she was born. She was actually born nine weeks early. And so um, she was in the hospital for about four weeks before I was able to bring her home. She was about three and a half pounds when she was born. So yeah, <laughs> so that's kind of a tough situation. We actually have some students that are um, going through a similar situation right now. And that has brought back a, a lot of memories for me being that it's been seven years since I was in that situation. So um, once I had my daughter, almost immediately went back to work because, of course, being on my own, there really wasn't a choice to do otherwise. I, I didn't have the luxury of being able to take, you know, nine or ten weeks off like a lot of people do. But, um, you know, my, my daughter has been so, so gracious in um, being able to see that, you know, she is my number one priority, but my career is a quick um, second, and the students and the things that I'm doing are a quick second because I, I want to be able to hopefully um, help others to see that just like in my situation, they too can, can move through any um, circumstance and um, any background and be able to achieve whatever they want if they truly have the hunger for it, they have the desire, they have the vision, and they commit to doing whatever it takes to be successful. Why did you choose not to marry her daddy? Um, you know, her father and I, um, he to this day is one of my very best friends. And um, again, I guess it comes down to a personal choice that people have to make. And in my situation, um, her father and I are, are great friends and we have a great love for one another. We consider each other family, but it was not the type of love that I would say is a commitment that you would make in a marriage. And um, I knew that you know, in the event that I ever would get married, it would be a one-time thing for me. That's something that I feel very strongly about, and I have very traditional values in that sense. And um, I did not want to make the mistake of getting married for the wrong reasons, knowing that ultimately the end would probably be a divorce. And to me, I felt like that would be a more um, trying situation for her to go through um, later in life as opposed to having the option of... Um, us being able to create a relationship that would work from day one, um, her knowing two separate households and two separate families that have a love for each other and that have made a commitment to um, work as a team and to overcome whatever, you know, difficulties come along with uh, having two separate households and, and just truly make it work, so. Well, I have, that, that happened to myself and also my uh, son and daughter, um, that I was married early, as I said, and then had then my husband did what happened so many times. He had a baby by another woman who was a friend of mine, and then he told me he wanted a divorce. And I said, why? Uh, he said, well, she's pregnant. And I said, well, we just had a baby. It was one month old. So I can I think you made a very wise decision. Then I met Tony a few years later and we married and have been married a long time and he adopted our daughter, my daughter. But uh, I think you were wise in that situation. And then I had a son and a daughter to go through divorces. And, and that's sad when the uh, divorced family has other children, which a lot of people do today. And then you have all these blended families. But <clears throat> this year, at the holiday season, we had the very best holiday we have ever had. The children and the grandchildren came, and everybody loved each other. And the step-grandchildren and the, all these people blended together, and we really had a great time. So you can. You have to deal with what uh, I think that you're dealt with in life. And for you, being a single mother, and then now at the very top of ITT in the city of Madison, Alabama. And uh, what is your, tell us what your position is, and also, uh, you, I know you found an incredible person you brought along with you to be part of your staff, so tell us what your position is called. Is it called president in this area, or is it, what? what is it? It's actually called director. I'm the campus director. And, um, you know, I have been so blessed and so fortunate to be able to find a number of just amazing people to join the team that have um, shared the vision that I have for being able to, you know, um, achieve student success and work with students and overcoming obstacles and really put the students first. And that is easier said than done because um, it does mean that a lot of times we come second and that's difficult um, because, you know, we all have 
have different things going on in our lives and we have different priorities and so forth but we know that we have a commitment to what we're trying to do for our students and that they have to come first so um, I've been fortunate to have an amazing management team and of course Dr. Nixon has recently joined um, on board as well as one of our chairs over the School of Information Technology and we're very excited about that um, we have one other uh, chair as well that is on board and then um, four other managers that work very closely with me and so um, in my role I I work with hiring in all departments whether directly or indirectly um, I oversee all of our daily operations um, I work closely with our Dean of Academic Affairs our director of recruitment um, the director of finance and the registrar as well as um, indirectly with our chairs and the rest of our staff in order to just make sure that we're you know operating um, both a, a college with integrity and you know maintaining our compliance standards there are a lot of guidelines that go along with being in higher education and and title four funded where you have you know financial financial aid available for students that qualify for that and so um, it, you know I, I would say the one uh, difficulty in the transition and moving up into a position at this level is that um, I do miss out on some of the student interaction that I had previously when I was a recruiter and and um, a department manager and those sorts of things in my past experience and so that's probably the most challenging thing but the way that I have been able to accept that is to know that indirectly now I'm able to impact many more um, students by being at this level as well as um, also taking those same principles of trying to achieve success and and vision and so forth with our staff um, and in developing them and working um, in guiding the management team as they develop their staff and and try to help them accomplish the goals professional goals that they have set for themselves as well so that helps me to to deal with that but it still is a struggle for me from time to time not to have as much interaction with the students well I'm sure you have a mission statement and goals and objectives and vision and did you help to put those together for the school do you know what they are um, actually as far as our um, mission and vision statements for ITT as a whole um, you know we have a, approximately 113 different um, campuses and facilities throughout the United States so a lot of those things are, are shared from campus to campus but what we have tried to do um, to sort of take ownership of, of our vision at the local level is to um, on an annual basis go through the process of strategic planning and each departmental manager set setting up you know what their goals are for the coming year and then you know filtering that downward through the staff to be able to work with them to achieve those individual goals um, but again ultimately it comes back to achieving student success and I know I say that again and again and we hear that again and again um, within our, our system and our various schools but it really is the the end result that we're looking for and that means different things to different students you know they all have their own goals and their own things that they're trying to accomplish and um, um, so, you know, how we go about implementing that in each department and with each student um, is it, different. It varies because we are human and, and what we need and what motivates each of us and what our priorities and goals are is different with each and every one. So um, ultimately, the, you know, the goal is that we're achieving their success and, and we really have to build relationships and get to know them in order to know how we can help them to be successful in that effort. Yeah. Do you you said Title Four thinks so? You have uh, available not only student loans but you also have Pell grants. You might explain those a little bit. Mm -hmm. Sure, um, we are Title Four funded, which um, basically means that students who um, come in to uh, apply to the college have the opportunity to also apply for Title Four funding, and that is comprised of yes Pell grants as well as um, various types of student loans. And we have a, a wonderful finance department that that really helps to walk students through that. Um, but basically, when you talk about the Pell grant, the difference between that and the student loan is that the Pell grant does not have to be repaid. However, I mentioned for those who qualify because there are a number of different variables that um, the federal government has set up as far as those qualifications and so um, again each student being an individual is a, a very much um, a case-by-case -case basis as to what they qualify for um, what they qualify for at one school they will qualify for at another but there's a, a application process that they do have to go through in order to um, find that out and so we have a, a two different individuals in our finance office that do assist with that. 
Now, in addition to their getting financing, uh, how is it different from a regular, say, a higher uh, a college or university? Um, they don't take, like, uh, English and or so many other courses, maybe math, or what are some of the courses they do take? Sure. Um, we actually do have available um, some associate degree programs as well as some bachelor's degree programs. And actually, there are some general education courses that are required. It varies from degree to degree. But um, our focus is really to try to make things as applicable to their career as possible so that um, students are not having to get bogged down with um, a large number of courses that they're not going to see the value of in their daily career because um, you know most of our student population are working adults and they have full-time families and full-time jobs and and all of those same things that um, that we deal with on a ba daily ba basis plus they're full-time students so there's a lot of different plates that they're balancing in the air and most of the time they're wanting to be able to move through that process and and see some results in what they're accomplishing um, fairly quickly and so um, you know you're not probably going to see a class like anthropology which was something that I took in college and I enjoyed very much but I can't say that I've ever used it you know so um, but there are some some of those basic um, general education courses you know will be come into play with the degree do you have daytime and evening classes and uh, what are some of the hours that they can take places Sure. Um, currently, we are still just offering the evening classes. However, um, I would expect um, probably by this summer and definitely by the fall that we would have um, daytime classes available as well. And really, it, that will probably come into play when we start to see high school graduates completing this year that are looking to then go on and pursue their education. But at the current time, the majority of our students are working adults, and evenings is what best accommodates their schedules. Um, so, th you know, that's the way that the class schedules work currently, as well as Saturdays. Um, so our evening classes start at 6 p.m., and as far as the time that they let out, that can vary. Um, but they start at 6 p.m., and then we have classes available on Saturday. I believe right now we just have one class that we're running on Saturday, but um, beginning in the March quarter, we'll probably see that expand to three or four different classes being available. I taught in Waco, Texas, and also in Tennessee, Oxford Graduate School, and different places around the country. And one of the things I noticed that the kids are texting in the class sometimes, and they're maybe on the phone to their friends, and it's hard to kind of watch what's going on. But I'm thinking there ought to be a way that they could learn from texting and from having, they love the video games. I know on Christmas Day and all the holidays, they're, what they want to do is get that new video game out there. Do you have uh, training for classes on video games or any of those? And if you do, how could we turn that into some kind of educational tool? There are um, some campuses within the ITT Technical Institute system that offer a, a program in that area. We do not. Um, the programs that we have currently focus in information technology. Um, we have a criminal justice program, computer electronics and engineering technology, and then we are also starting uh, computer drafting and design as well in the March quarter. So um, we do have a, a lot of diverse um, uh, you know, offerings, and as far as the tech one of the things that I would say that I've noticed has changed over you know 10 years of being in this industry is we went from um, contacting students and prospective students when I first started primarily by phone and maybe by mail and then transitioned into you know a lot of emailing and now we actually are seeing text messaging as sometimes that's the only way we can reach reach our students or um, even staff and employees so it's amazing to be able to see how that technology has evolved over time and I think um, you know, down the road, we'll probably see some of the education, you know, evolve along with that as well. But um, we don't have any classes with text messaging yet. <laughs> We're not <there> yet. <laughs> But I think something like that's coming because yeah. we got the teleseminars and the, uh, so many people are doing online and blogging. The students and the teachers now, uh, 
how could you see the future of education with more of the technology, like from some of your other campuses, or something that you guys have discussed in some of your strategic strategy meetings? How could we use fewer teachers to get to more students? I, you know, I do think that the, the online sector does um, provide a great avenue for that. Um, however, I think it's also something that a lot of times we have to be a little bit cautious of. I don't know if you've ever taken an online class. I'm um, currently working on my master's, and I'm, I'm doing that um, through online courses. And, and we do offer some online courses as well. But um, what we find a lot of times is that Online sounds like it can be very um, simplified and easy, and oh, I'm at home in my pajamas and I'm working on my computer, and there's some truth to that, but in reality, if you've taken the courses, a lot of times they are much more demanding um, and, and can be more challenging and overwhelming at times than people realize, especially if someone has been out of the classroom for an extended period of time and is trying to relearn how to learn again, you know, and, and just getting used to doing homework and writing papers and taking tests and study habits and those kinds of things and so um, really what I have found is that most of the time our students tend to be most successful really in more of a traditional classroom setting and and um, you know a lot of times we might have students who are taking a blended um, sort of format as well where um, they have a situation that requires them to take um, an online class from time to time but for the most part we find that our students have been very successful in that traditional classroom environment. Well that's really true that, and there's no doubt about it it's better to have 25 students than 300 students but there is uh, I went to Baylor University and some other places and um, one of the things that they did would have one teacher like in an auditorium with the overhead projectors and so forth and one teacher could teach a lot of students but they are also doing some of that online too where one teacher because the one of the things uh, with the economic downturn right now is that there's not enough money to get enough school buildings and school teachers, the funding for the teachers, so something has to give in the regular education. And one of the things they did in the Philippines that I'm hoping to implement in here is that they have a, a daytime, they have morning classes and afternoon classes for they utilize the facility two different times and you could do that I could see you doing that here like you're going to have morning day students and evening students you're using you're utilizing the same facility for doubling the efforts and doubling the number of students that you can hand handle uh, how do you think a person could do you're taking that online and I'm teaching the online back that goes back to the Philippines and I have a coordinator in the Philippines who is not a degree teacher but can uh, document the grades for the school there how do you think we could do some more online teaching you know, I think that over time, the demand is only going to continue to grow um, for that format. And I think that um, a lot of times I will talk to students who maybe get in a situation where that's a must for them. And, and I think a lot of f times for many, many people, it's a practical necessity. If I know that my goal is to get a degree and I know that I don't have this X amount of time to be able to spend in the classroom every week, then it's going to be a natural progression that online may be the only option and I think over time um, that will continue to grow. I think that um, with podcast and webcast and some of these different things that that you're referring to um, there will be more and more opportunities where a classroom might be run with a traditional class interaction there and at the same time being on the internet and available I know currently we have a lot of professional development opportunities that are already operating that way um, so I do foresee that that could be another avenue that that we might see um, come to fruition in the coming years as technology does evolve and develop um, but there's no way around it. Every um, aspect of education we're going to see become more and more high tech and with the goal ultimately of making education and higher education in particular more accessible to students and that's really what um, I think we all want to see happen. Our philosophy just happens to be that we want to be able to maintain as much individualized and personalized education as possible for our students and so that just tends to be what our tendency is, is to, to 
as most is, as most most universities would prefer to have the student in front of the professor, and so that they can interact a, a little easier and better. But I can see, and it, it's exciting to hear you talk about ITT is open to other avenues of technical training, distance learning, and uh, some of the online training that's going on. Well, I want to thank you very much, and I'd like to encourage every person that's listening, if you know of someone that would like to go to college or get some training that would be specific to a job. I know my husband is chief engineer of a company. He could use some uh, people that know how to design uh, AutoCAD uh, design on computers and because they don't usually have the big drawing board anymore. They're doing all this design on computers and he just desperately looks for people that are that can do some of that work and well now you have an opportunity to go and get that education for that here I don't know what all they're teaching but you can find out and we're going to give you not only our number uh, which is a toll-free number I think it's running across the screen now 877-823-6886 but you can talk to uh, Dr. Jamie Carpenter or Jamie Carpenter and Dr. Charlene Nixon at ITT and uh, give us that number. Yes, the number for ITT Tech is 256-542-2900. And I also wanted to mention that we are having our ribbon cutting on January the 27th at 4 p.m. And we certainly encourage anyone that would be interested in coming out and taking a tour of our campus to uh, join us on that day. Wonderful. Plan to be there. And I do did want to get into if it's comparable in um, cost to any other college, but I guess we'll have to just have the person ask you in person. If you're not available, and maybe Dr. Nixon or one of your other people will be available for that. Okay. Absolutely. We'll be happy to um, discuss any questions that anyone has um, with our financial aid office or with any of our recruiters as well. Sure. Well, I want to thank again environment owner Enviro safe. I had to move over so I could see it. So we could help keep it, what does it say at the bottom? Running. And that is uh, Terrell Nixon who owns that company and taking his wonderful time out to be with us. He does so many other things and Dr. Nixon does too. She does a lot of online teaching and online taking and is if you want, I'm sure she will find the time to talk to you if you'll call ITT. If she doesn't, I'll come after Dr. Charlene Nixon. Well, I'm Bonnie Liphart along with Jamie Carpenter and Dr. Nixon and her husband, Terrell Nixon, and you, without you wouldn't matter. Bless your heart for watching.